Well, as you take your seats, go ahead and open your Bibles with me, if you will, <clears throat> to the book of Acts, chapter 10. And as you do, my, my very first vehicle was a 1990 sky blue pinstripe down the side Ford Ranger. I love that little truck. 90s country on, throw the fishing poles in the back, and let's go. That's, that's my teenage years. It's early college. I even took uh, Leslie on some dates in that old little Ford truck. Lots of memories and lots of life lessons associated with that little truck. Like the first time that my check engine light ever came on, light comes on. I know this may shock you. I didn't know what to do other than take it to the shop. That little light is on, like just glaring, right? You can't see anything else but that little light that's right there in the dash. And I'm like, in my mind, thinking, if I don't get this to the shop quickly and get it fixed, my car is going to blow up. <laughs> like, I don't know what's going on with it. So I take it in. They run the diagnostics. They come out. And they tell me it's been fixed. And charge is $50. I'm like, $50? That's way better than I thought. <laughs> like, I'm thinking, engine's going to blow up. I've got to get a new engine. I'm ecstatic. Until, until he tells me that the $50 is basically tell me that I did not have the gas cap on correctly. $50 to tell me I did not have the gas cap on tight enough. Who knew the gas cap not being on tight could cause a check engine light to come on? Like some of you are like, I did. <laughs> I didn't ask you. No, I didn't know. <laughs> not this guy. They did not teach me that in driver's ed. They should have. $50 to get a lesson about a gas cap. Now, fast forward to this past Christmas. So just before this past Christmas, I pull out of the garage to go run an errand. And guess what comes on? The gas cap, I mean, the, not the, the, the check engine light comes on. It's like, there it is. <laughs> Different vehicle, same light. Yep, there it is. And guess what? The first thing that I did, I stopped the car, I turned it off, and I went back and I checked the gas cap. Took it off, tightened it back on, turned the car back on, and guess what? The light was gone. <laughs> yes. $50 lesson, never forgotten. <laughs> And I'm sure every one of us have our own versions of lessons learned throughout life. Some maybe learn the hard way. Some learn through simple reminders such as this. But lessons learned and never forgotten. But if we're being honest, I'm also pretty sure that there have been plenty of lessons where we haven't been as quick of studies, have we? Maybe it took us or is presently taking us a, a long time to learn or even accept what God is trying to teach us. We're not good students. And friends, we're not alone. Just think about the Apostle Peter. He first followed Jesus because he honestly believed Jesus to be the Messiah. Praise the Lord, right? Lots of naivety, but he was right. Jesus was and is the Messiah. But later, what did he do? Later, he, he rejected the idea that Jesus must suffer and die and rise from the dead. Even though Jesus told him that this was going to happen three different times, yet Peter's response is, oh no, Jesus, that's never going to happen to you. To which Jesus responded by saying what? Get behind me, Satan. That's a tough lesson to learn. <laughs> Later, Jesus telling Peter, 
You're going to deny me three times before the, the rooster crows. Peter's like, no, -uh, not, that's not going to happen. I'll never do that. But what happened? He denied Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. There's so many things that we can look at with Peter and be like, oh, bless your heart. Like a giraffe learning to walk. Like there, there's, there's Peter. Opening his mouth at apparently all the wrong moments. Saying the wrong things. Joyfully stepping out like I'm going to walk on water with Jesus. And then he looks down and is like, oh boy. <laughs> and there, there he goes. But good try. <laughs> Just so many things with, with Peter. But then, post-resurrection and after the arrival of the Holy Spirit, it's like, wow, look at Peter now. <laughs> he's not only learning to walk, he's learning to run. <laughs> look how much he's grown. I mean, look at it. He's boldly preaching Christ. He's being used of the Lord to heal paralyzed people and to raise the dead. He's even the one who Paul comes to see in Jerusalem. Paul wants to come see this guy in Jerusalem. But as we're going to see today, he still has a lot to learn and a lot to accept if he's going to faithfully follow Jesus. And here's the thing, church. So do we. There's a lot that we still have to learn and there's a lot that we still have to accept and apply if we're going to faithfully follow Jesus. So picking up in Acts chapter 10, verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all of his household, gave alms generously to people and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a, a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was in, inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for you, your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them to be his guest. Now let's pause here for today. 
as this gives us plenty to look at, it gives us plenty to think about and plenty to ponder before we continue further in the story next week. So today's sermon, you can essentially say, is part one of at least two, likely more, because I want us to take our time with the story of Cornelius and his household. I don't want to rush this, as this event is, is one of three watershed moments, um, one of three key events in the book of Acts. Maybe you can think of what the, the first two might have been. The first one being what? Pentecost. Pentecost is the obvious answer there with what happening at, at Pentecost. The Spirit descending upon the 100, 120 or so who are gathered in the, the upper room, giving them the ability to be able to speak the gospel and to glorify God in the, the tongues or the, the actual languages of the people. And while the people they, they spoke to that day were predominantly Jewish people, remember a, a large number of them were gathered in Jerusalem from all over the regions and all over like, the world from the nations because of the ongoing festival that was going on in Jerusalem. So people had come from all over, meaning the languages many of these ethnic Jews spoke were what? Gentile languages. Why would they have been speaking Gentile languages? Because going all the way back to the exiles uh, in the Old Testament, that's where their families scattered to, dispersed to, were taken to, ended up staying. It's where they settled. So they're Jewish by ethnicity, Jewish by religious beliefs and practices, but their everyday language, their heart language, uh, was from wherever they lived. Thus, Gentile languages. So that's the the first watershed moment. But now the second event was what? Paul's conversion. Each of these being repeated multiple times throughout the book of Acts. And we also see Paul's, not only his conversion, but his subsequent commissioning to take the gospel to who? To the Gentiles. Paul's commission, like your job is to take the gospel to the Gentiles. This is referred again back to multiple times throughout this book. And then we come to Cornelius, his household being this third watershed moment where God gives his spirit to who? The Gentiles. A point that we're going to look at next week and in the coming weeks. But do you see the theme of each of these watershed moments? It's the gospel going forth to who? To the Gentiles. It's God's love and grace extending outward to all the peoples of the earth, not just the Jews, but all the nations. The primary location of today's event being where? In Caesarea, which is a city, it's a town like right on the Mediterranean Sea, approximately 74 miles northwest of Jerusalem, but it's still in Israel, and it's occupied by who? Rome. Everything in this area is occupied by Rome. Thus, the reason that Cornelius is is there, because Cornelius is who? He's a Roman centurion, the leader of a fairly large regiment of Roman soldiers, which tells you what about the public perception of of him or others like him among the Israelites. Well, you would, you would think, for those who, who would not know him, that you would think that his reception would have been much like that of uh, a Roman or a, a Russian soldier in the midst of Ukraine right now. How would a, a Russian general or a Russian regiment of soldiers be received by the Ukrainian forces or Ukrainian peoples? Basically thinking, like, get out of our country. We don't want you here. That's the way that the Roman soldiers were received by the people of Israel. We want to be our people in our place, so get out. What else do we learn about Cornelius here that sets him apart? That he's a devout man who feared God with all of his household. That he gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. This telling us several things about Cornelius and and his likely public perception there in Caesarea. One, that he was unlike 
other Roman officials. He likely had a, a good reputation among the people of Caesarea. I mean, typically people who are handing out money and giving alms to the poor, like they, they gather a pretty good reputation among the people. He seems to be a very kind person in the community. We're told in the text he has a good reputation among the people as a result of his generosity. But two, the reference to being a God-fearer is a commonly used reference to refer to Gentiles who, who believe in the one true God of Israel. Meaning, this tells us that Cornelius is monotheistic. He, he and his household believe in the one true God of Israel. But this term also is used to imply that while they believed in the God of Israel, they, they have not embraced things like circumcision or the customary dietary laws, which means that the Jews still consider them unclean. Okay, yeah, you, you believe in the God of Israel, but you're, you're not following him the way you're supposed to, so you are unclean. There's a division that was there. A reminder that someone can claim to believe in God, can even claim to believe in the God of Israel, but that doesn't mean that they truly know God or believe in the God of the Bible for who he actually is if they do not believe in Jesus. You want to know God? You must know the Son. But here's what this does tell us about Cornelius. It tells us the Lord is clearly doing something in this man's life. It tells us the Lord is, is laying the groundwork here to prepare his heart to hear and receive the gospel before he ever hears the gospel. The Lord already doing something in this man's life for him to have disavowed his pagan, polytheistic, multiple God-worshiping culture that he would have grown up in. The Lord doing something in this man's life for him to offer prayers such as these and alms such as these as a memorial before God. His prayers that we see here are very similar to what we see from the Israelites dating all the way back to the start of the Exodus when they cried out to God for deliverance. Very reminiscent of what we see here. And the Lord is doing something in this man's life to give him a vision such as this. So he may be what many would refer to today as a, as a seeker. Neither atheist, nor agnostic, nor ambivalent to the things of the Lord, but filled with questions, wanting to know more. The Lord preparing his heart to hear and to receive the gospel, even he doesn't even know what that means. This desire not coming from the outworking of his flesh, but from what the Lord is already doing in his life. And friends, this may be true of some of you today. You're neither atheist, nor agnostic, nor completely ambivalent to the Lord, but you don't truly know him. You haven't truly repented of your sins and, and begun to follow Christ as your only hope in, in life and in death. But you're here today. You're here today. My question is why? You may not even know why. The Lord does. See, I don't believe in coincidences. I do believe, however, that the Bible teaches about God's providence believe very much in God's providence. And thus, I don't believe the Lord has you here by accident today. I don't think those questions or those doubts and those thoughts are there by accident. And so I pray that he's using the questions and he's using the doubts and that are presently percolating in your heart and in your mind and the circumstances of your life to prepare your heart to hear and receive the good news of Jesus Christ. But church, here's what we as believers can never forget. That every conversation that we have, every prayer that we pray, every action that we take, every moment and every circumstance is being used of the Lord to prepare the hearts of his children to hear and to believe at the divinely appointed time of his choosing. That's what we have taking place within our text. So, so let us be remindful, mindful and remain faithful to what God has called us to do. As we have no clue 
no clue of what part we are being used of the Lord to play in someone else's story. We don't know if it's our prayers, they're being used, yes. We don't know if it's our conversation, our actions, or what that is, but let us be faithful to the ends of which God has called us. Consider Peter's vision here for a moment. He's on the rooftop praying around 12 o'clock in the afternoon. So he's hungry. (laughs) Lunch is being prepared. He falls into a trance. He receives a vision from the Lord. And what's he see? Verse 11, the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. The four corners of the sheet likely representing the four corners of the earth as the sheet with its contents is let down where? On the earth. (laughs) It's a picture that is being laid forth for us here to teach. And one of the contents on this sheet, verse 12, in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. So there were animals that were likely both clean and unclean according to the Old Testament dietary laws on this sheet. But clearly unclean animals are present. And what instruction came from the Lord next? Verse 13. And there came a voice to him, rise Peter, kill and eat. Jeremy paraphrase version Peter, smoke that pig and eat it. And how does Peter respond? Verse 14, Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Thus clearly you have never had good food, Peter. But in all seriousness, do you see what Peter just did? Do you see what Peter just said to the Lord? By no means. He tells the Lord, no way. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Have you ever done that? Have you ever done that? Are you doing it now? Refusing to learn the lesson? or accept the lesson that he's been trying to teach you over and over and over again? But then how does the Lord respond to Peter's refusal? Verse 15, and the voice came to him again, a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. That's a strong rebuke from the Lord. But here's a question that I'll make. Not so much in Peter's defense, because hear me, I'm I'm not trying to defend Peter. You don't tell the Lord by no means. But I'm trying to get at the heart of why would he say this? Like why is this question being asked? Why, Why is this being put forth? When did God make such animals and such foods clean? Like, why? when did this happen? Peter feels this way because all he's ever known is that Leviticus teaches that <laughs> these animals are not to be eaten. His whole life has been spent that way. If you're going to be a faithful Jew, a faithful follower of the Lord, you do not eat these foods. Thus, what's the basis for the Lord's rebuke of Peter here? How how is Peter to know that all these animals had been declared clean? Like, how does he know this? When did the law he'd known all his life change? Well, keep your finger here and turn with me to Mark chapter 7, verse 18. Where Jesus, walking with his disciples, including Peter, calls all the people together. So a crowd of people together. And he tells them to hear and understand. When a parent tells a child, I want you to hear and understand, what are they expecting? I want you to listen to what I'm saying, and I want you to apply it to your life. I want you to get this. He's telling the crowd, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him 
but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Now, his disciples hear this, and they're like, we have no clue what this means. (laughs) I have no idea. What's he talking about? So when they're away from the crowds, they're tucked away in in a room in a house, and they ask him, what does this mean? Tell us. And Jesus responds there in verse 18. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? They're like, yeah. <laughs> Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not, in, not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. So here's the question, church, both for Peter and for us. Are these things... This immorality, these thoughts, this theft, this murder, all of these things, are they only found among Gentiles? No. They're found among Jews and Gentiles. Meaning the lesson being taught here is that the state of one's cleanliness or defilement before the Lord is not determined by what you eat or what you drink, nor by the color of your skin nor the place of your origin, nor the language that you speak, but by the state or condition of a person's heart. Which is clearly a lesson that Peter did not learn the first time Jesus taught it. Or maybe he did. Maybe he did learn that lesson, but he didn't like it. Maybe his prejudice was getting in the way. Maybe his prejudices are standing in the way of his obedience. You ever been there? I know that's a hard question. (laughs) You learn a lesson? You understand the lesson. But you don't want to accept it for whatever reason. Do you refuse to apply it for whatever reason? Maybe your prejudices that you don't even want to admit or maybe even don't fully recognize standing in the way of your obedience. Maybe your prayer is only going as high as your prejudices will allow. I think our political landscape is a prime example of this. See, this sheet and its contents provide a very powerful visual to teach a very important lesson of how the good news of the gospel is not just for the Jews, but for the entire world, including the Gentiles. It's teaching John 3.16 that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The whoever, the whosoever referring to who? Whoever. (laughs) God cleansing the sinful hearts of everyone who believes. But again, not a lesson that Peter is either getting or accepting quickly, is he? How do we know this? Because Peter gets this rebuke to not call common what God has made clean how many times? Three times. Why three times, Peter? Because he didn't get it the first time. Then he did not get it the second time. And even after the third, we're told he was still perplexed by what all this meant. There's just something about Peter and taking three or more times to learn a lesson, isn't there? I think that's why Peter's so relatable. There's something about the number three as well, because when Peter's vision ends, who's at the gate? Three Gentile men arrive at the gate of his house. 
his vision ends, and there are three Gentile men waiting. Now, you talk about God's perfect timing. Vision ends, and there are three Gentile men standing at the gate of the house. Peter comes to the gate. And I can picture him being like, okay, Lord, I get it. I get it. I finally understand what you're trying to teach me. And how do we know he gets it? One, because he invites these three Gentile men into into the house as guests, which would have included a meal at some point since they won't leave for Caesarea until the next day. He's inviting Gentiles to the dinner table. And to understand how big of a deal that is, number two, verse 28, that we'll look at further next week, where we have Peter in Cornelius' home. So he goes and he's saying, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Meaning he finally gets it. There is no one, not even a Roman centurion, outside the reach of God's mercy and grace. He gets it. He finally understands that when Jesus said, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, It didn't include just those who looked like him. It didn't include just those who thought like him. It included all the peoples of the earth. He learned that there are no by no means with God. And that's takeaway number one. There are no by no means with God. Which means there can be no by no means with us. So here's what I want you to do, church. At lunch today, grab a napkin, grab a paper towel, grab a sheet of paper. has to be white. (laughs) But this is symbolizing the white sheet. And, And be honest. And write down those names. Write down the people or groups of people who you have in your mind is by no means. By no means. In that, in, in either in your heart of hearts, you don't honestly believe that they're ever going to come to faith. It's just impossible. Or maybe in your heart of hearts, and because maybe of how they have hurt you, you don't want them to come to faith. You wouldn't say it that way, because that's just harsh. You say, maybe I want them to be saved, but I don't want them to experience God's grace. I don't want them to experience God's blessing. Write those names down. See, when we get right down to it, part of Peter's underlying reservation of accepting that God's heart is for all the peoples of the earth was because he didn't want all the peoples of the earth to receive God's grace like Jonah with the people of Nineveh. Not them, Lord. Anyone but them. Write those names on the napkin. And then remember number two, God can and will save anyone he chooses. It's not our place to make this determination. We are seed sowers, not soil testers. We plant and we water the soil that God provides us to work with. And he gives the growth. He brings the life. As Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 37, all that the Father gives to me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Even Roman centurions. Even the names on your napkin if the Lord chooses. No one 
No one is outside the reach of God's mercy and grace. But three, all people must hear the gospel in order to believe the gospel. And yes, just as we see in our text today, God is graciously working to prepare the hearts of his children to receive the good news before it is ever received. The preparing coming in any number of ways, whether it's through questions or circumstances or doubts or any number of things. We'll even hear stories today in certain parts of the world where, where people receive, are receiving visions similar to what we have within our text today. For example, while I was on a, another trip overseas in a Muslim country, members of our mission team felt very strongly impressed upon to share the gospel with a particular Muslim woman in a public marketplace large public marketplace, lots of people around, and felt very impressed to share the gospel with this particular woman. And yet we were hesitant for multiple reasons, but felt strongly impressed to share the gospel with her. Plenty of people to share with, but to share the gospel with her. So a couple of us approach, openly express that we are Christians, and that the Lord has a message of good news for her. And here's her response, church. As her face lit up with joy, lit up with joy, and then said, in the best English that she had, maybe you can tell me what my dreams mean. I'm getting nervous in that moment. And then she says, I've been having a recurring dream over and over of where I am standing at the gates of heaven and Jesus will not let me in. Can you tell me what this means? Yes. <laughs> yes, we can tell you what this means. <laughs> and we tell her what this means means. We connect her with a local church. We connect her with local missionaries. We get her a Bible in her own language, and she is overjoyed with excitement. <laughs> and I wish I could be able to just tell you even more of how that story goes. I don't know how much further that story goes, but the point being, God can and will prepare people's hearts to receive the gospel in any number of ways. Maybe in ways that make us feel really uncomfortable like that did me. <laughs> That's not what I grew up with. That's not normative. But here's the reality. Here's what's essential. Here's what is normative. They must hear the gospel in order to have any chance of believing and receiving the gospel. For faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. We must preach and proclaim Christ. Dreams and visions are never enough. Experiences are never enough. Cornelius had to hear the gospel which is exactly what we have happen with Cornelius, who, spoiler alert for next week, Peter will go to Caesarea and he will share the gospel with Cornelius and his household. And guess what? They will believe. They will know Christ. They will know God for the very first time, truly, exclusively by the grace of God. But thus God's call for his followers is to be what? His witnesses. And thus, the reason number four, we need to welcome all peoples to our table. Because God invites people from every tribe and tongue and nation to his. See, to share a meal is to share fellowship. To shun a meal is to shun fellowship. Case in point, the Lord's Supper. This table is reserved only for those who are 
publicly identified by the church as being followers of Christ. It's a family meal reserved only for baptized believers. But whosoever believes and follows Jesus can come. We want everyone to come. (laughs) And fencing of the table that takes place, the prevention from coming to the table in the immediate is always an act of love rooted in the eternal. We want people to truly know Christ and faithfully follow him according to his commands. But here's the thing. While that's the case for the Lord's table, our personal dinner tables are different as they are actually the first step to this table. Our dinner tables, our coffee gatherings, like Peter inviting the three Gentile men in as his guests, are where we meet the names on our napkins where they are at in compassion, not judgment. They're where we invite the stranger in, not to scapegoat them with the gospel, but to listen and to learn and to dialogue, not to debate worldview, but to learn what makes another person tick. We may not identify with the person or persons at our table at all, but we listen. We ask questions that show that we care, and we continue to faithfully identify with Christ. We make it evident through our compassion and through our words that we are willing to walk the long journey with them as long as it takes Not by by shoving the gospel down their throat and trying to get them to make a decision on the spot, like pray this prayer, but by being real. By being real in, in who we are in Christ and faithfully and compassionately pointing them to Christ over and over and over, over time. Planting seeds, watering, and trusting God to bring life and to give growth no matter how long it takes. Church, this is an important lesson the Lord wants us to learn and to apply. So who on that napkin, on that sheet, can we have over for dinner? Or to go out to dinner with? Or to grab coffee with? Who can we as a church join in praying together for? You don't have to make that known to everybody in the room. But share it with your connect group. Begin praying together for this person or persons to come to faith in Christ. And don't stop until they do or they're they're taken out of this world. Don't stop praying. In fact, let's do that now. Let's do that now. So whatever names are on your napkin in your mind, names that immediately pop down, like that's the name I'm going to write down. Let's pray for them to come to faith in Christ. Let's pray that we may be faithful to apply these lessons that God is teaching us through his word. And to recognize the gospel is for all the nations. If you would, right where you're at, heads bowed and pray for God to save these individuals. That God will make himself completely glorious to them. That Christ will be the greatest treasure. And that they will be unsettled and restful until they trust in him as their only hope in life and in death. Let's pray for them now.
Lord, right now, there are names in our minds of people that we know, people that we love, but people that we are, by the evidence at hand, are pretty confident who do not know you. And Lord, we're praying Lord, we're praying that you will do what only you can do. And you will open their blind eyes, their dead hearts to believe and receive and to see Christ as all glorious. Lord, bring them to saving faith in Christ. And Lord, help us to be a steady, loving, consistent, safe place for them to continually be pointed to Christ. Not just through our actions, but our words, but let our words be tactful, Let us know when we're pressing too hard and know when to to back up and then when we need to go further, let us know. (laughs) Lord, take the, the soil that you prepared and bring a great harvest. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.